and we have a very robust energy programming at GMF throughout our network, both in DC and in our European offices that bring together, like here, government officials, business leaders, and people working in think tanks and on the analysis. And I'm very happy and honored to uh, introduce the moderator of our session, Nina Dos Santos, who's coming back for the third time here. Uh, she is the world business anchor at CNN. Nina, please. Um, thank you very much. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me for a third year in a row. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers as they uh, take their seats. I'm sure you're aware of a number of these individuals here. Uh, starting out with the Honourable Borger Brenda, the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Norway. We also have the Honourable Miguel Arias Cañete, the Commissioner for Climate Action and Energy for the European Union. From the private sector, we have Mr. Dev Saniel, Executive Vice President, Strategy and Regions at BP, with specific focus on places like Europe and also Asia. And Jay Robinson West, who, as I'm sure all of you in the room know, has been <laughs> involved with the German Marshall Fund for many of the years and a key part of this Brussels Forum debate that is now celebrating its 10th year today. So, let me start out by talking about the, the broad topic that we're going to be here to discuss. I'm sure all of you in the room want to examine various issues here, various specific parts of the energy debate. But of course, we can't ignore the fact that the oil price is extremely low. That gives you sleepless nights or less troubled nights, depending on which side of the uh, supply and demand dynamic you are at. Um, we're going to examine that. We're also going to talk about the issue of energy security, which is paramount for this particular region. Maybe there's some lessons that we can gain from the United States. And climate change, because obviously with the oil price and gas prices being so low, does that suck the impetus from countries, from companies, to impose the kind of regulations that perhaps we need to protect the planet for future generations to come? So let me start out first by introducing you, um, Dev. You're from the private sector. The oil price is so low. BP is obviously a huge oil producer. How is this changing the landscape for energy today? Well, I think uh, the way it's changing the landscape is the way people are responding to their thesis about what's going to happen in the future. Uh, if you think about the world of oil from the love index, LUV, there are some who believe there's been a secular shift down. In other words, the price of oil has got rebased forever. There are others who believe that this is a V. In other words, there'll be a sharp recovery. And there are others who have a perspective which is more about a flat U. In other words, it's cyclical, but it's going to recover over time. Based on your thesis of what's going to happen, people are responding. So there are some companies that are clearly uh, recalibrating, but keeping their options open. Other companies are working through cycles, and others are taking a different view in terms of the investment regime. How is it changing the conversations that a company like BP and all big oil companies have with local and national governments here? Because obviously, presumably, that is changing significantly because of this. I think the key, Nina, is to do two things. In the short term, how do you manage your financial framework so that you've got financial resilience to tide over, if you will, the thesis that you may have in terms of the oil price recovery, while at the same time maintaining options for the future. So the conversations have been around how do you manage the books in the short term, how do you drive deflation in your cost base, OPEX and CAPEX, while at the same time retaining options for the future. Robin, I want to come to you because obviously the, the price of oil is being felt particularly hardly in the United States. A number of shale oil gas producers now having to ramp down production, shed staff, just shut down outright because the economics of it just don't work at this level. Where do you think the shale oil industry is going? Do you think that the low oil price at the moment is a bit of a flash in the pan because shale oil will come offline eventually? Or do you think that it is that L or U or V-shaped curve that you're talking about, Dave? Well, I think it's important uh, to understand that the, the shale oil boom uh, was uh, undertaken by entrepreneurs. It was by small companies that didn't have the big cost structures of, of major oil companies. Um, and they made these breakthroughs first in natural gas, then in oil. Um, and um, what's happened now is the price of oil has collapsed. Their cost structure has gone down as well, too. Um, OPEC is trying to squeeze out 
uh, this North American production. But it's proving to be a lot tougher than they thought because, frankly, these very entrepreneurial uh, uh, oil executives, they're bringing costs down. And people thought shale wouldn't work at $60. It works at 60 They thought it wouldn't work at 50 It works at $50. they are they are keeping it coming down. So this, uh, I don't think this production is going to be shaken out anytime soon. I want to come to uh, Minister Boga Brenda. How is Norway being affected by the current low oil price? You know, we uh, decided uh, 15, 16 years ago to allocate all the running revenues from the oil and gas sector into our sovereign wealth fund. And then we use the real interest of the sovereign wealth fund can be allocated our, in our state budget. So uh, the sovereign wealth fund is now 1,000 billion US dollars, the largest one in the world invested in average owning 1.5% of all globally listed companies. So uh, in medium long term, if the oil price and gas price stay uh, low, we will have a slower growth in the sovereign wealth fund, but it has no immediate effect on the running revenues for the government. Let's broaden things out. Uh, but before I do, though, I just want to remind Everybody out there, you can get in on the conversation. I want to make this as interactive as possible. I'm armed with my Twitter handle, the hashtag uh, Brussels Forum 10, of course. And don't forget that you can, of course, use your BF Connect app to send in questions. I don't have any yet, but as we start to get them, I'll start to feed them in. We should talk about energy security here. And Commissioner Kenyette, I want to come to you uh, to ask you about how significant the difficulties that this region is having with Russia is vis-a-vis -vis your particular portfolio trying to enhance Europe's energy security profile for the next 10, 12 years and also include climate change into that debate. It's clear that the European Union is highly dependent on imports of energy. We import 400 billion euro a year, 1 billion a day. And uh, in some cases, uh, in mainly in gas, there are some countries where are very highly dependent on a single supplier. And that creates big problems in, in situations like the ones we are seeing these days. So that is why we have put in action an energy union project, which one of its main pillars is energy security. How are we dealing with it? First of all, we did a stress test in 2014 to, uh, to acknowledge the real situation and the capacity to react to situations of crisis. And that has led us to have reverse flows in the, in the gas pipes and the possibility of interconnect all the countries in one sense, on the opposite sense. Thus, this year, for example, Ukraine is buying more gas from European sources than from Russian sources, and that diminishes the intensity of the problem. It doesn't eliminate fully. On the other side, we want to have different routes of supply. That's why we are supporting the Southern Corridor and giving all the political and technical and economical support to develop this corridor and have different supplies, in this case initially from Azerbaijan, but in the future from other countries. But the Southern Corridor will not make up the huge amount. Europe needs something like 500 billion cubic meters of gas every single year. One third of its gas is imported from Russia by a very fragmented network which allows Russia to have bilateral agreements with different EU countries. How can you surmount that? The Southern Corridor is not going to help counter that entirely. It's, it's is an it? initial step and it will develop further. Uh, energy strategies are long-term strategies. This is a very important uh, step forward. And I imagine if we connect with Turkmenistan and, and, and in due course, if the situation in Iran improves with Iran and the situation in the Mediterranean improves, there will be many possibilities. That's why we are doing the Southern Corridor. But also we are working in, in Bulgaria with interconnectors, with interconnectors, Bulgaria, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, developing the capacity of having a cl most close link. And we want to develop a strategic uh, energy partnership with other countries like Argelia and to connect also by gas the Iberian Peninsula with the Central European network through France. So there are many possibilities to have different security of supply, different suppliers and different routes. These are very big projects and of course they will rely on huge amounts of infrastructure money put into this. This comes at a time when obviously as I was saying before the, the oil and gas prices are currently low so it's hard for private and public sector stakeholders to commit the money to those funds. Are you finding that it's difficult 
having the visibility here to commit money to those kind of projects? No, we have established the Juncker plan, the, the FC, uh, the European Strategic Investment Fund, and there are many demands of financing for projects, so money will not be the problem. The project must be a market case, so that private investors come to them. But when there is a case of uh, 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 European interest, we have the Connecting Europe facility to make to give grants so that it breaks even. So we work on, the, on, both, on both sides, private investors and then support from the European budget. In those cases, there is a big European interest in developing a single infrastructure. The reason why I'm mentioning this is Borger Brenda, uh, Norway famously had a deal with Lithuania and Estonia, which changed their energy profile quite significantly, helping them to diversify themselves away from uh, Russian gas. Um, how successful has that been? And can Norway be perhaps the answer to energy issues and energy security issues that the EU is facing today? I think we can be a contributor, and we are, we are already. Uh, Russia uh, responsible for 30% of the gas that is consumed in the EU, Norway 20%. We can step up further uh, in the years to come, making natural gas a bridge from a fossil fuel-based society uh, to a more uh, low-carbon economy. That is the vision of the European Union. And we know that uh, if natural gas uh, can come instead of coal, it emits uh, half uh, of what coal does. On the LNG, um, for uh, Lithuania, this has uh, been an important step forward, also for diversifying uh, their um, energy uh, situation. And I think with, uh, with Norway contributing 20% of, of the gas to, to Europe, we, I think the political risk related to Norwegian export is, is lower than uh, from some other uh, actors in the market. Also as a reflection, you know, with the big picture that we are now seeing with uh, energy security and diversification really on the agenda, and it should be on the agenda, I think that uh, Putin, uh, President Putin has also in this field uh, made a cardinal mistake. Three, four years ago, was energy security on the top of the agenda of the European Union? Everyone in Europe is now looking at not being in a situation in 10 years where you have to rely so much on one distributor. And even during the Cold War, and we know this because we also have been a distributor for some years from Norway's side, there was not created this kind of insecurity and also a willingness to use gas in the political uh, context. And this is not very strategic. I'm slightly skeptical about that comment because I distinctly remember covering as a journalist the 2007-2005 issues when the pipelines almost shut off in countries like Belarus, Ukraine, and energy security came right to the fore of policymakers' minds here in Brussels, and then it fell off the agenda a little bit. So, um, Minister, uh, Commissioner Kanyete, how can we make sure that that isn't going to happen in well, three or four years from now? First of all, because we have developed uh, Energy Union project, which one of its main pillars is energy security. And we are going to enforce it. So the European Council yesterday, also in his conclusions, uh, um, agreed with the view of the Commission, the framework uh, strategy of the Commission, and instructed the Commission to develop it. So we are going to work in, in, in diversification of routes, suppliers. We are going to develop a new LNG gas strategy in the European Union that we haven't had ever to see what are the missing links and how we can improve it, in view mainly because we are discussing with the United States the TTIP, and there will be possibility of additional exports in the future and improvement in the pricing, in the pricing systems. So we, we are going to prepare us not only with natural gas and traditional pipelines, but also with LNG strategy and, de and developing additional hubs. We want to develop a Mediterranean hub which is also competitive. Yeah. And, of course, that'll take uh, quite a number of years before it's up and running, but it's still commendable as a project. Um, a little sooner than later. <laughs> let, me, let me start bringing in questions here from the audience that have started to come through uh, here on the BF Connect and uh, Twitter uh, platforms. And, again, this just goes back to the issue, uh, Mr Minister, of Russia. So here's a question which feeds into what we were talking about before. What real effect do sanctions have on the Russian energy sector, and does Russia still have energy as a weapon? So I'd like to ask both of you to answer that first. 
I think Norway, as uh, one of the largest uh, energy exporters in the world, is not particularly hit by it. But uh, and being the sixth largest producer of hydro. But to the to your question or to the uh, to the question, I think that what we have seen now uh, in the annexation of Crimea and also the destabilization and break of international law uh, in Donbas, I don't think this is easily forgotten. And I don't think it should be easily forgotten. The, the security landscape um, is different from what it, it was. And I think it's every nation's responsibility to also make sure that energy security is a very important part of your policy. And you should diversify. So this is a unique opportunity uh, to look at different ways of, um, uh, of the, uh, this, uh, diversifying. On Russia, if and how potent is uh, this uh, energy tool as part of their way of, uh, of uh, making uh, their influence in, in Europe and also in, in the Baltics. I would say that with the economy that is now contracting 4 to 5 percent and in a situation where um, also there are uh, fundamental challenges in the Russian uh, society and with the depreciation of the ruble, I think they are more focused now on getting paid for the energy that do they export. From an EU perspective, uh, Commissioner Kenyatta, um, is Russia losing a little bit of its might when it comes to using energy as a foreign policy tool? Because obviously, as uh, Minister Bogobrenda was just saying before there, they've got to be nice to the customer because the economy is really we doing will, badly. We will do all the efforts needed so that energy is not used as a policy tool. And we will diversify routes, suppliers, sources, everything we do. But on the other side, Russia, Russia will be uh, a, a supplier of the European Union in the future. And when the conditions are right, we will have to restart the energy dialogue with Russia. On market conditions, with transparency of contracts, on a different basis, respecting the European laws. But we will have, they, will, they will have to be partners in the future. But market partners. BP is obviously big in Russia. You've had your trials and tribulations with TNKBP in Russia. Um, how significant is Russia uh, as a market for BP? Obviously, it's huge from an oil and importancy perspective, but are you finding that it's difficult doing business there? So Russia, put in perspective, is the world's largest hydrocarbon province. And one of the, I guess, debates in the last few years has been around energy independence of some parts of the world, like the United States. I would actually argue that energy interdependence is the narrative of the day of the current net day and will be the narrative for the future. Because the reality is, four countries hold the resources, 50% of the resources in oil and 50% of the resources in gas. So ensuring that there is, if you will, the trading relationships that sustain energy security is incredibly important. Russia is important in the context of what it provides in terms of energy security to many parts of the world. Obviously, Europe is a very important part of it, uh, given the fact that, as you said, 30% of uh, imports are from Russia. BP has had a very long-standing presence in Russia. Uh, it's been a very successful presence. We now have a shareholding, a 19.75% shareholding in Rosneft. And, uh, you know, at the current time, whichever way you look at it, the key is to make sure that there is a flow of resources from resource holders to markets. In other words, the molecules have to get to ultimately the consumers. And how is the implementation and ratcheting up of sanctions against Russia from the EU, how is that affecting your relationship with Russia as a, as a European company doing business out there, or does it not? Well, we are continuing to um, do business in Russia within the context of the uh, very specifically directed sanctions. And Russia is continuing to be uh, a very important source of energy security for Europe. I want to ask you, Robin, how, from a US perspective and also just the GMF perspective as well, and somebody who's been in US government, how concerned are you about the current uh, rhetoric between Russia and the EU and the concerns about energy security in this region's over-dependence, some might say, on Russian gas? Um, 
in Washington, obviously, there's a lot of concern of, uh, of uh, European uh, dependence on Russia, and I think uh, there's a lot of support for an effort to, to create uh, um, a new energy union and to diversify. I think one of the, the really very serious questions is that uh, Russia, as Dev said, is a very important province uh, to the world markets. And how long are sanctions going to go on? Um, how, how will a transition be managed uh, to some uh, new structure? And the outcome isn't clear, but it's, there is a real worry that, uh, again, depending on uh, your, price, uh, your, your view of the world, that we could be in a V situation where prices could collapse and then investment doesn't take place because of low prices, demand picks up, and then the price spikes again. Um, in that case, we're going to need all the oil we can get, and we're going to need Russia. Russia is very important. So isolating Russia long term is a very bad idea. Do you think that's where we're going? I think there's a risk of that. Uh, it's, it's partly up to, uh, it's uh, certainly, Mr. Putin has a lot to do with that. What about diversifying Europe's energy and gas stream from other countries? For instance, uh, Libya was a big producer of hydrocarbons, and now obviously that's a country that's in turmoil. Some of the traditional energy partners, in terms of sort of where the supply was coming from, are now having a really difficult time and are offline as well. Is that exacerbating the situation, would you say? Well, one of the things that happened, uh, uh, one of the things that kept... Uh, the oil price from going to $150 a barrel or some very high price uh, last year, 18 months, uh, was uh, when uh, uh, Libya went down, we lost several million barrels a day production there. Uh, there are problems in Nigeria. Uh, there are a number of producing countries. It was just the time when America filled that gap. And uh, now um, um, the markets are, are fully serviced. But I, I think that, that um, I mean, for example, the elections coming up in Nigeria, um, if those elections go poorly, um, there is a potential for instability, if not civil war. Um, that could be a huge interruption of supply. I mean, if there's one lesson I've learned in this business is it's not a predictable business. I mean, I've made a pretty good living trying to predict it. And all I can tell you, it is not very, <laughs> not very predictable. Very wise words. Just coming back to, before I leave the issue of energy security for Europe, um, Commissioner Kenyette, I must ask you about, before we were talking about the Southern Corridor and its importance for Europe's diversification of energy. The, St the South Stream project, though, by the Russians seems to be over. How is that changing things? The European Union always considered that building South Stream didn't increase our security of supply. We will be depending on the same provider. So that doesn't change our policies at all. The Russians has, have told us that they will put the, the gas in the future in the, in, the, in the green border, and it's up to the Europeans to build new big pipelines. We are not doing so at the moment. We are developing interconnections in southeastern Europe, the ones I told you in Bulgaria, and trying to develop the, the, the southern uh, corridor. That's what we are doing. We are going to, not going to change. If there is gas in Turkey, there's the possibility up to, to collaborate, but okay. But that's it, change our problem. Our problem is dependency on single suppliers, and our problem is using energy as a political tool. And we have to prevent that in the future, and we will work in that direction. Uh, Dev, I want to ask you, um, from a private oil sector point of view, BP has actually done some research that says that this particular block will be relying on foreign energy sources currently gets about 53% of its energy imported from elsewhere, but for two-thirds of its energy needs by the year 2035, I think it is, according to your own research. How much uh, should people be worried about that, especially considering what the minister was saying about, uh, the commissioner was saying, excuse me, about trying to diversify energy supplies, so of course we won't get to that kind of scenario. So we take a perspective on this, Nina. Europe today consumes around 15% of the world oil demand, and in terms of gas, it's around 18%. Europe today has around 0.4% of the reserves for oil and 08 for gas. So the reality is that Europe will need to be very much integrated and has been for many, many decades now integrated in the global trading system. It again goes back to what I said earlier. Uh, it is critical to think about energy as a global commodity. It's critical to think about how we lubricate that interdependence rather than talk about a rather triumphalous independence point of view. 
And if the world is so interconnected, we of course can't just talk about the European perspective, we need to talk about the United States. The other side of the planet, what are going to be the main pressure points here? If shale gas does eventually come back online, the price comes back up. From a US perspective, what happened to peak oil? Where do we go from here? And what do you think for the next 10 years? Um, well, there are a couple of questions you asked yeah. there. Um, <laughs> the first is that in the United States, when we think of energy security, given the oil shock of 73, 74, we talk about oil. In Europe, energy security is natural gas. So we have a very different perspective. The second thing is I think that um, in terms of oil, which was a big trauma, um, that the United States will never be energy independent. It's more secure than it was before. But as Dev pointed out, there is a global system. Um, and oil is a, a, a fungible commodity traded globally. Natural gas is completely different. The United States is utterly independent in natural gas. We have over 100 years supply. Um, gas is priced differently than oil, and it's much cheaper in the United States. So that the perspective of the United States is it's radically different than it was. We've, we've shifted from, from uh, scarcity to abundance. But I think when it particularly comes to oil, um, people should take a deep breath. Uh, we've gone, our imports have gone from 60% to 30%. We're still importing. We're still very much part of the global system. Now, on the question of peak oil, one of the things is that People said the world is running out of oil. The world will never run out of oil. The world may run out of cheap oil. But what happened was, and what usually happens, and it happens in each high price spike, is there's more investment in technology. People assume technology is static. It is not static. And, and there are constant breakthroughs. Um, and so um, it's, it's dynamic, but again, it's, off, it's driven by market forces. Are you investing in technology in Norway? at a time like this when obviously the gas and oil prices are so low? It's not the government investing, it's the companies of course, investing. Yeah, but and, it's a um, country. I think uh, a lot of companies do have medium long term visions for this. We know that for example probably 20% of the undiscovered oil and gas resources on, are uh, in the Arctic. But uh, the break even is quite high, especially with this kind of oil prices that we are seeing now. But, you know, uh, fields that uh, were extremely expensive only a decade ago is today have a break-even of uh, 30, 40, 50 US dollars. So the technology is a driving factor. And um, uh, there, is, um, th there is a lot of important uh, decisions going to be taken uh, also in the coming year. What we saw from the OECD report on the global economic outlook on Wednesday is that due to lower oil and gas prices, we will see 1% extra economic growth this year. And in the one or two years, this will lead, of course, to increased demand. So now we are in a situation where we have a discussion about the demand and supply um, related to the oil prices. But um, you know, with 1.3 billion people not having a, even access to basic electricity in, in long term, uh, the, the demand for energy globally will increase 30, 40 percent by 2030, probably. I want to ask you, Dev, uh, one of two questions, just sort of feeding off of that. If the oil price is so low, BP's already announced massive cuts for its North Sea oil operations. Um, it's expensive to consider drilling at a time like this, presumably. And also, at the same time, the European Union's new energy union that's going to be created, it's not necessarily on the oil side, more on the electricity side. It will hopefully perhaps reduce prices for customers. So are you foreseeing a sort of price issue when it comes to investing in oil and gas to get it out of the ground now because it may not be worth as much later on? I think, um, just to go back to the sort of peak oil uh, idea, this idea was very much fashionable when I joined the industry. Uh, 25 years ago. Uh, I think there's a great uh, geologist by the name of Park Dickey who once said, when we thought we were running out of oil, we discovered we were running out of ideas. So when I joined the industry 25 years ago, deep water was 300 meters. Today, deep water is 3,000 meters. Uh, we've looked at sort of energy uh, efficiency over that period. We've also seen greater uh, you know, recovery rates uh, in that period. And that trend will continue. That's just the nature of innovation and the nature of technology being deployed at scale. Um, I, I think it is very, very hard to say that the prices will be X or Y. 
uh, one has to sort of, uh, I think, have the flexibility uh, to deal with a range of scenarios, which is why it is important to do two things, as I said in the very beginning, to have a resilient financial framework to sort of see through that cycle, but at the same time to have a very clear line of sight around the projects that you need to execute, so you're not chopping and changing as you're working through those projects. My own sort of view is that uh, the industry has been very, very capable of managing the cyclicality because the reality is when the price of oil, some people forget this, it was $9.62 in 1998. I remember that time very well, as do you, Robin. Uh, the reality is the industry had a sort of returns of around 10 to 15 percent. When the price went to $110, the returns of the industry were between 10 to 15 percent. So things calibrate for the rent structure. I think that's important to recognise. Right. Now, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. I'm aware that we haven't yet started the debate on climate change. So if anybody wants to kick that off, um, I'm just going to see whether there's a microphone in the room. So we have uh, one question for the gentleman at the front. I'm going to take three questions at a time. So Christoph Marshall, these two. I would like to stay with the uh, oil oh. price uh, for a moment. Since you all said convincingly that we have so many, um, so many fields where you can produce oil at a price of forty, fifty dollars and if it's going to seventy, eighty there will be a lot. Why should in the next decade the oil price raise at any time again over hundred dollars? Dev, why should the oil price at any point go back up to hundred dollars? I think Paul Samuelson said if you forecast, forecast often. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't know what the price will be, but I think the important factor to consider is that today, fundamentals are being priced in to oil. World peace is being priced into oil. If those factors change, then the prices will change. As we've seen, when prices go up, demand destruction becomes a narrative that changes the price set. And we saw that in August of 2008 when the prices went up to $147. So I think, you know, ultimately it's going to be fundamentals and it's going to be a sentiment that's going to drive where the market is. You know, this idea that, you know, around the edges people are doing things to the price of oil, I think has been disproven. Fundamentals ultimately price in uh, uh, to, the, to the oil uh, regime. Let me take another question, um, one at the front. I'll take these two together, if you don't mind, from the lady there and then the lady afterwards, thanks. My name is Niki Javela. I'm a former member of the European Parliament. I was in the Energy Committee for five years. And my question is to the Commissioner, uh, security of uh, supply, is it only supply from producers? Do we expect include exploration and exploitation of Europe's indigenous resources, not only on energy, but rare earth as well. And this question moves me to a question to all the gentlemen in the panel. How realistic do you see uh, Europe producing shale gas, let's say, in UK and Poland? This scenario is out. We don't see it anymore. And how important do you see the deposits of gas that they have been discovered in the Mediterranean? Israel is already exporting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then the next question. Thank you. Sonia Lee from Belgrade. Uh, my question is also to Commissioner Canetti. Uh, it is well known that in 2009, uh, Southeast Europe was one of the most hit uh, with the crisis. Uh, the energy community, obviously, in Vienna, is trying to do <coughs> a lot to overcome this very, very serious dependency. Uh, especially, of course, on the Russian gas. Some of the countries are 100% dependent. Um, according, to, according to some uh, leading experts from the European Climate Change Foundation and others. In fact, Southeast Europe has a lot of potential in, 
making the situation much more energy efficient if there would be more cooperation. Uh, you mentioned interconnections, but the problem is that, for example, Bulgaria is producing much more electricity that it can spend while other countries in the neighborhood are dreaming of new uh, coal plants. So my question is, what will the Commission do immediately and, of course, within the energy union strategy to uh, foster much more cooperation in using energy? in Southeast Europe. Right, now it sounds like there's two questions for you there, Commissioner Kenyatta. Um, apologies uh, to you who asked the question for all members of the panel, just because I know we have to get on with climate change too. I'm going to moderate that and ask Mr. Kenyatta to take both of those. We, we already last month launched a high-level group in Southeastern Europe to analyze the situation, cooperate with all the relevant ministers and develop the infrastructures. And the Commission will be follow closely that all the needed interconnectors are established, are put on action, and we will do the political support and technical and economical if needed to develop them. We acknowledge this is a major problem, and we made, when we make the stress test, we don't only focus on the energy union, also on the energy community, because solidarity and trust amongst ourselves are needed. On the other question of uh, uh, indigenous sources and, and what happens with shale gas, the treaty in uh, the European Union is very clear. Article 194 establishes that any member states, member states have the capacity to decide its own energy mix and explore the sources they want. The, 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 the European Union only does two things. If they go for nuclear, they establish the most stringent safety standards. If you go for shale gas, we have established recommendations of how the environmental impacts should be handled. We are now assessing what has happened after these recommendations for launches in 2014, what are the best practices in the world, and after that sound analysis we will, deliver, we will uh, think whether additional legislation is needed in order to uh, uh, guarantee the, the, the environmental protection if cell gas, if hydraulic fracturing is put in place. But nobody prevents a single member state to develop the technique provided they follow the, the European Union recommendations. Right. Apologies to this side of the room because I've had my back to you for much of the last 40 minutes. So let's take some questions here from this side of the room. Um, Madam in the front. Uh, my name is Yoriko Kawaguchi. Uh, I have one comment and one question. My comment is that when we were t you were talking about security, uh, one thing, one very important thing which is missing is China and India. The Asia's uh, consumption demand will go, grow tremendously. So in the longer perspective, you just cannot be talking about European security, energy security. That's my comment. Uh, my, the question is that one word which has been missing so far, uh, never heard of, is nuclear power generation. And in terms of climate change, it's very clean. And um, in Japan, as for the reasons you know, um, no power, nuclear power station is working at the moment. But if we think of climate change, and if we think of security of energy supply, it's about time that, the, of course, there are uh, conditions in various places, but overall, we, we should be thinking globally what we think of nuclear power stations and then should try to introduce it to supply for the, for the supply of energy and then think of together what we could do for the waste and I would like to get the view of whoever is willing to. I think uh, Commissioner Kenyatta I'm going to have to come back to you on this actually because we've got we've got the the Paris climate change talks and thank you very much for opening up the debate here on climate change because that was what I was going to go to now how big a part can nuclear play in Europe to that discussion? In, in, in the European Union, as, as I stated before, uh, member states are free to develop nuclear if they want and to make nu nuclear plants. At the moment, there are some in, fin in Finland going on. In Hungary, there are new developments announced. In France, it has also announced that they will uh, prorogate the, the life of their actual nuclear plants. So there are many member states who use nuclear power. Others who are willing to develop them further. What we, what we make sure is that there is also safe security in supply of, 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 of the 
uh, uranium and the, and, the, and the nuclear fuel for these uh, plants, that they are no longer dependent on single suppliers. Also, we come back to security of supply also in nuclear. And that is uh, the commissioning of a plant is done in the proper way, and that the uh, disposal of uh, spent fuel is done under the proper conditions. That's uh, in the safe, safe and proper conditions. We, uh, after all, the European Union started with an uratom, started with, uh, with, the, with the coal and the steel, uh, and, and we are still having lots of competences in nuclear. Area. And for a country like Norway, that obviously is a huge producer of oil and gas, is nuclear part of the future portfolio of your energy needs here for a cleaner Norway? Domestically, we have no plans for utilizing nuclear. That is also coming back to my point that 99% of our electricity comes from hydro. And we are also the sixth largest producer of hydro and exporting a lot of renewables through hydro to the European Union. And we can increase that. But I think the broader question that also Madame Kawaguchi raised was the global energy mix and the global demand. And as I also said, we should not lose uh, the following picture. By 2050, we're probably 10 billion people on this planet. Probably the energy consumption will have to increase with 50%. So the real question is how can we decouple this necessary growth to fight poverty with the growth of CO2 emissions? This is really the big issue. What do you think the answer to that is then? That we need to continue to use all the incentives that are necessary to move from a fossil-based uh, society to a more renewable, low-carbon society. And we have started on that, but uh, it's not going fast enough. Uh, and then you have to, of course, on the methods, you have to do what you learned the first day uh, when you start economics, internalized externalities, a global CO2 tax that tax what you uh, are emitting. And everybody said that this will only work if it's global, if it's implemented among all those 196 countries that will be taking place in the Paris talks. Um, Dev, I want to come to you again from a private sector point of view. Some people have said getting a concerted effort and concerted rules and regulations that actually work on global climate change really will hinge on incentivizing the private sector as well to help people unhook themselves from fossil fuels. So from the private sector, what can firms do to combat climate change? I think, Nina, when you look back in time, prior to the financial crisis of 2008, there was a strong focus on the end state in terms of the sustainability debate. I think we need to look at the transition to that end state as well. And gas has a very important role as a transition fuel. The reality is, when you look at the fossils complex, 60% of the emissions are from coal. And the reality is, if there is a 1% displacement of coal in favor of gas, that has the same effect in terms of GAG emissions with the 11% growth in renewables. So this is not to say renewables is not important. It absolutely is, and our own forecast is that the largest growth in the uh, energy complex is actually happening with renewables. But gas has a very important role as a transition. And so for from my perspective, the question is how quickly can we hasten the pace towards the gas transition, number one. Number two uh, is the issue of the carbon price. Uh, if you price it, then you will start seeing the investment regime move. Uh, you will see behaviors move. Uh, and we actually support a, a carbon price, an economy-wide carbon price. And thirdly, uh, you have to look at energy efficiency, the amount of wastage that there is in the housing stock. In the e EU, it's 75% wastage. Uh, across the world, uh, only 12% of primary energy is actually deployed in the way it was intended. The rest is actually wasted or it's inefficient. And last, it's about investments in R&D for a low-carbon investment regime. Yeah. Robin? Um, I agree with everything Dev said. I, I want to... Uh, I don't know whether it's challenge the minister, but I want to raise a question. And there are some people who argue that we want to move from a carbon-based economy to a carbon-free economy or something like this. With all due respect, that's nonsense. It's, it's, the numbers just don't work given existing technology. Um, now, one of the things, though, um, to kind of add to what Dev said, is that natural gas actually is, is going to be a very important factor in facilitating renewables. The problem with both wind and solar is interruptibility. The, 
wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. And you can't store electricity. There's been very, very little progress in battery technology to store electricity. So how do you manage this, this question of interruptibility? And the, the technology of natural gas is changing. So that in the old days, um, to, to cycle up a gas turbine took a long time. Now, frankly, given technologies that come from jet engines, which you turn on and off, you can cycle up uh, these turbines quickly so that now natural gas combined with renewables, it's actually, it's cheap natural gas, plus the cost of renewables is coming down. So I think you may see that, ironically, uh, hydrocarbons may be critical uh, in the development of renewables. When it comes to these Paris talks, and, and the, the 2009 talks that we saw in Copenhagen, what kind of partner is the United States going to be in these upcoming talks in November and December? Um, I, I think that uh, I, I am the last person to speak for the administration, I can assure you. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, the, um, uh, my impression is that uh, uh, President Obama looks on um, climate as a real legacy issue. Um, the administration is um, it's all climate all the time. Uh, regulations just came out uh, the day before yesterday in the Interior Department uh, relating to climate and, and uh, moving revenues into renewables. Um, I think there's a. Um, uh, I, I think that the uh, the president is very enthusiastic. I think there is much less consensus in the country. I, that being said, I think there is a growing sense, kind of in the middle, um, that climate really is a serious problem. Um, and it's got to be dealt with. But I don't think that there's much uh, confidence in the, um, um, uh, the, the policy options there right now. Do you really think that we're going to have some concrete framework agreed in that Paris meeting, especially bouncing off of the China-US accord that we saw? Well, I'm skeptical that they will be um, uh, very binding. Um, I mean, you may have a framework, but I'm not sure it's going to be binding. And I think that, that remember that, that uh, again, um, um, this is a very unpredictable area. I mean, uh, 10 years ago when we had, uh, and we talked about climate 10 years ago here in Brussels, nobody would have thought that the United States was going to be the star performer when it turned to uh, uh, reducing um, uh, carbon emissions. And um, so that there, there will be changes in technology, and I agree entirely that unless um, um, there is a, uh, a price for carbon, uh, unless it's priced in, nothing's going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. But it's somehow, the other thing is, is that India and China can't be free riders in this. The United States just won't, won't work with that. Commissioner Kanyete, how confident are you that we'll get a binding agreement? This is part of your portfolio. I, I am pretty confident that we'll get it because this is not only a serious problem. Probably is this the most important challenge of this century, because glo global warming is a reality. If we don't avoid the increase of temperature over two degrees centigrade, the consequences will be dramatic. That's clear. All the scientific evidence is on, on the table. Nobody can contest it at the moment. So we must fight global warming. And the European Union is doing so. And we expect other countries to come along with ambitious commitments. We have already said to the United Nations, our intended national determined contribution, 40% reduction of emissions internally within the European territory, not using international credits. And at the moment, Switzerland and the European Union are the two uh, parts of the convention that have signed the commitment. We expect all the major players of G20 to come along with ambitious commitments. The United States, Russia, China, all of them. What commitments do you think should be in a binding framework to make it last? Because as I was saying before, if it's not stuck to by all of the countries involved, then some people say it'll never get off the ground in the first place. First of all, there must be a global final target. The European Union is proposing that we support a reduction of 60% emissions by 2015. It means a long time, so it's real that we, in the meanwhile, that we not only renewable sources, but we have to use conventional sources. It's clear. This is not decarbonizing an economy is not a, a thing done in the, in the next week or the next year. It's a very long period. And we need carbon markets to give pricing signals. That's why the European Union 
we have a, a, an emission trading system. That's why the, the Commission at the moment is establishing a market stability reserve. That's why we will come with an ETS proposal uh, in the next months to have at least the European Union uh, a carbon market. Other, other areas in the world are developing carbon markets in the United States, in China, in Switzerland. The, the idea situation will be a global carbon market yeah. eh? and then pricing for carbon and then it will steer the growth towards renewable energies. But we are doing those in the European Union. We have the 2020 objectives. Eh? 20 efficiency, 20, 20 renewables, 20 emissions. We are achieving them. Now we have 40% reduction of emissions, 27% in renewables, 27% in energy efficiency for 2013 and we will achieve them also. Because it's very clear. If you want to have the, the, the less emitted source, is not, co not consume energy. Every 1% of energy efficiency a country achieves, the European Union achieves, redu reduces imports of gas by 2.6%. So we are fighting in all the grounds, in renewables, in energy efficiency, decarbonizing the economy, establishing carbon markets, but we want all the other major players in the world to do the same thing so that there is a competition level playing field. Yeah. We, will concede, we will obtain two things, fighting climate change and have a level playing field. If the European Union on its own will not be able to do so. We are leading the level of ambition and we will keep on doing so. We will work closely with China and the United States to bridge alliances with other countries. And I think Paris must be a success. Okay. Let me take some more questions here. Um, there's one at the back, one at the front. Uh, Rob Atkinson, Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. So I want to take uh, exception to this notion that price is really the driver of this. Uh, we wrote a report about two years ago where we looked at about 10 major technology innovations from the 20th century, including energy, and there wasn't a single one that was affected by price. They were all technology push, not technology pull. They were all driven by innovation, including uh, fracking and natural gas. That was really driven by DOE-funded R&D. So uh, if, you look at it, if you look at Europe, for example, compared to America, America has significantly more um, electric cars than Europe, yet the de facto carbon price in Europe is probably 10 times higher through the gas tax. So I guess I, I would argue it's really innovation and R&D that we need in this space. It's not price. Price helps. Price can, can be a supplement. But the, the notion that somehow we're going to get where we need to go based on price, the evidence of the past just hasn't borne that out. Okay, right. thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that in just one minute. I just want to take another question, another couple of questions, in case they feed into the same dialogue. Thank you. Hello. I'm, I'm Kori Udovicki from Serbia. And coming from a transition country, I must say I have heard and elaborated myself endless arguments for why interventionist policies will not really get supply or demand, whichever you want to intervene on, where you want. The only way to do it is through price. So this is also a price-related question. But my question is, why are we talking about carbon markets, about push for technology, about all sorts of ideas about how to affect the supply and demand of for renewables instead of what the minister mentioned, a carbon tax. And it should be a value-added carbon tax that affects demand, ultimately. It would solve the question of climate in no time, and it is almost never on the table. I'm not sure who I am asking. <laughs> I'm going to put your question to this gentleman in the front, Robin, who looks perfectly poised to answer both of those two questions. Lucky me. Um, <laughs> uh, on the question of, uh, of uh, fracking technology, um, the Energy Department um, uh, helped underwrite the development of some technology, um, uh, which was basically there. But it was the application of this technology which was driven by market forces, which was the key. That changed everything. And um, uh, that I... I was involved in that process, and, and the price of natural gas was the key factor in driving that. In terms of a carbon tax, um, I think a lot of people feel that a carbon tax uh, is clearly the most efficient way to do it. But one of the problems in all of this is political will. Um, and um, uh, in the United States, um, uh, there, is, um, uh, there simply isn't the will to do it. Um, and um, 
Um, uh, so I, I, th this is a, I, I would defer to much smarter people than myself who understand politics. Uh, but I think that, uh, um, uh, that this is going to be a, a long and torturous path. I mean, the, the two market approaches either you, um, as a carbon trading system uh, or a tax, and uh, whichever one is, is the least painful. One of the problems with carbon trading, of course, is that politicians sometimes have been known to issue a few too many permits, which causes the price to collapse. Uh, and so the whole system collapsed. Um, and that's what happened in Europe before. And so, at any rate, it's, it's, so there's a, a question of, it's really a question of politics. From the, from, can I just, oh, sorry, go ahead. But yep. if I may say, well, I understand that that's really a question of political will in the US, but then I don't understand why Europe goes through the trouble of, of making these complicated markets instead of advocating the carbon tax. Commissioner Cagnetti? If there was a global carbon tax equal for everybody with a level playing field, but we, we, have, we have opted for develop this carbon market. It had some imperfections. We are correcting it with the market stability reserve. And within it will work. And we will be market driven without tampering by politicians. Are you is, convinced that's the best strategy? We are convinced, otherwise... Or is it just the easiest strategy to implement at the moment? We are convinced the discussion of carbon tax or carbon market has been ongoing. There was make it a choice and you cannot be changing policies daily. We have established, establishing a, market, a carbon market that works properly takes time. Linking with other world markets takes time. And we have developed this idea, we are correcting the imperfections and I think it will work. When you hear this kind of political discussion here, as a business person at the helm of BP, <laughs> what do you think? Because obviously business leaders say day after day, well, the problem for us is we just don't know how to navigate this ever-changing policy mix. I think two, two observations, uh, Nina, from my side. Number one, one has to look at a suite of things that need to be done, not just one or the other. So, for example, on the issue of innovation, uh, and R&D spend, absolutely, because you have a cap and trade system or you have carbon taxation, doesn't mean that you stop doing that. Uh, so I think it's important that we actually have a suite of things being done to encourage energy efficiency, to encourage R&D investment, to sort of create a trading mechanism, and to have, if you will, the price signals that results in the, the outcomes that results in, over time, uh, a, a low carbon economy. Uh, from our perspective as a business, I mean, put in perspective, most people think of us as a resource company. BP runs the world's largest civilian supercomputing center. It processes two billion million petaflops a second. I don't know what a petaflop is, but it's a lot. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and so technology is, I think, yeah. the great enabler, uh, as Robin was saying earlier as well. And the second point I would make is business looks for certainty. Uh, and the, the more we can achieve that certainty, the better it is because our investment cycles are very long. Last week we signed a deal, a $12 billion deal to invest in the West Nile Delta. We've been in Egypt when King Farouk was in charge, we were in Egypt when Nasser was in charge, we were there when Sadat was in charge, we were there when Mubarak was there, when Morsi was there, when Sisi is there. So we look at a long-term cycle in terms of our investment. So it's incredibly important to have <coughs> certainty. So the more certainty we can achieve, the better it is for the investment climate. Okay. Mr. Brenda, do you have a strong view about whether or not we should have a carbon tax or a carbon trading system? A global carbon tax is the best option. Um, I think what the European Union has done uh, on agreeing to reduce their emissions by 40% by 2030 uh, is uh, something very ambitious, very good, and it is a prerequisite for having success in uh, mitigating global CO2 gases. Norway will also uh, act uh, adapt uh, the same system. That's very tough for us. You know, if you have 99% of your electricity being renewable and you cannot uh, just shut down a coal-fired power plant or two and then reach the goal, that's a much uh, tougher uh, way. But we also have to set examples. What is new now compared to the Kyoto is the willingness also from the emerging economies to be part of a global deal. Without the fastest growing um, emerging economies as part of it, you can just forget it. That has to be a very important part of uh, COP21 in Paris. And without a low carbon economy, there will be no 
a real deal on, on climate, because we have to move into a low carbon economy using all the necessary resources to do so, because the cost of non-action far exceeds the cost of action. Yeah. Robin, just briefly, coal. We haven't really dedicated enough time to talking about coal, because everybody goes to talk about gas, perhaps even nuclear, oil. But coal is the elephant in the room, particularly when it comes to China and countries like that. Is there anything that realistically can be achieved in these Paris talks to try and calm the effects of coal, to bring down the reliance of China on coal? Well, China and India, both, um, and, and other parts of the developing world. I mean, coal is uh, it's very inexpensive. Um, and um, um, I think that, that in the, 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 the near to medium term, what... Uh, uh, we have to find ways to encourage, frankly, the use of natural gas um, and natural gas and renewables. Um, but I think that uh, coal is uh, uh, coal is uh, is a factor. Uh, coal isn't going away. Um, it will remain a factor in the United States. I think about 40% of our electricity is generated by coal. Over time, it'll go down to 30% but it's going to stay there for a long time. Are you a buyer of this argument of clean coal? Clean coal is an oxymoron. Um, uh, and um, I think when it comes to uh, uh, moving, removing particulate matter and everything, there have been tremendous progress. But when it comes to CO2, um, it's very difficult. There's this a concept called carbon capture and sequestration, which the environmental community has been pushing hard uh, as a solution of way to manage coal. Um, uh, as Dev can tell you, nobody knows more about carbon capture and sequestration and storage than the oil industry. Um, but what they're talking about is, frankly, is completely unrealistic. Um, and uh, uh, that's, that's a silver bullet that the environmental community is hoping for, and I just don't think is, is going to work. Mr. Mr. Brenda? So one thing is that coal is already very cheap, and we see that uh, the consumption of coal is increasing in emerging economies. But on the top of it is heavily subsidized. Look at Indonesia, Egypt, India, using 20% of their state budget to subsidize something that environmentally unfriendly. So I'm happy to announce that Norway will now increase uh, very much so uh, our support to the World Bank's fund, that they go in and incentivize developing countries and emerging economies to use this unique opportunity with lower oil prices, lower gas prices, lower coal prices, to end their subsidies, use the subsidies for education and health and good governance, and then uh, it also uh, is very environmentally friendly. And to cushion this, we will contribute as an energy uh, producer because this is really one of the lowest hanging fruit yeah. fruits in Paris to cut these uh, irres irresponsible energy subsidies for coal. What would be your ideal criteria for deeming these Paris talks a success? What would make COP21 in Paris a success for you? Presumably including that. Yeah, I think that is a part of it. And other low-hanging fruits, stopping, for example, deforestation of rainforest and uh, deteriorating um, situation when it comes to forestry, that's also a low-hanging fruit. We need, in Paris, to lay the ground for the two degrees scenario that will not increase the global temperature with more than two uh, degrees. Because if we do so, uh, the cost of this uh, will be... Um, extremely high and we are in many ways the first generation that is seeing the effect of climate change and we are also maybe one of the last generations that can really do something to change it. So it's a, a huge responsibility and we could, should race uh, to uh, that uh, responsibility. Ever so briefly, um, Commissioner Kenyatta, what would be your criteria for success here, walking out of those COP21 talks and thinking, the my, world has nailed it here. My, my, my criteria will be that we should establish a long-term objective of reductions, a long-term commitment of all the parts, 60% of reduction of actions, binding mitigation targets for all, each part according to its possibilities, a dynamic process of assessing if the efforts put on the table are enough to cope with the two degrees integrated increase, Paris will have attach a dynamic review process every five years. And also there should be important uh, uh, chapters for, ad for adaptation, climate finance, 
transfer of technology and capacity building that we should support because there will not be agreement if we don't favor adaptation in developing countries. There will not be agreement if there is no commitment to transfer of technology. There is no agreement if there is a substantial financial package to aid developing countries to adjust to the problems of climate change. So it must be a very ambitious and comprehensive package and we have to work from here to there so that all the countries come with commitments, with INDCs, before the Paris summit and that we can assess the level of our ambition before we go to the negotiating table. So some busy time for diplomats between now and then. Um, let's take three more questions because we've only got five more minutes. I'll take them uh, together. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hari Haran. I'm from New York. This is a question for Dave. Dave, in, in New York, we commonly hear two refrains that at the margin, shale has become the swing factor in establishing prices. And secondly, uh, in keeping in, in line with your comments about financial sustainability and long-term views, uh, the feeling is that good guys have bad assets and weak hands have the best assets. Meaning, you know, large oil majors, state-owned um, uh, petro petroleum companies have all these deep sea, long gestation periods. In fact, somebody said Kasha Gan is now called Cash is Gone or something. So, Would you care to comment on that asymmetry? And do you see a big transfer of portfolio, big guys like you, into things like shale, where you take out weak guys? It's an excellent question. <laughs> yes, thanks. Uh, Nelson Cunningham with McClarty Associates in Washington. I've got a question that goes back to the energy security question at the beginning, but also about price. It's currently illegal to export crude from the United States. We can export liquid natural gas, but only after a very cumbersome uh, permitting process in which there's been a substantial backlog. So the U.S. is, is offering little in the way of supply of either crude, zero, or liquid natural gas, some. Uh, if we were to change our law and to permit exports of crude, to permit more liberalized exports of natural gas, uh, A, what would that do to the price of oil and gas in the United States? And second, what could that contribute to energy security in Europe? Yep. And I'll take a third question. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Reinhard Budikofer from the European Parliament. My question is on the so-called carbon bubble. The governor of the Bank of England, uh, other major actors in the financial sector are talking about this uh, threat to the financial markets because, as we all know, according to the analysis of the IEA, two-thirds of global fossil reserves have to stay underground in order to achieve the two uh, uh, 2C goal. How do participants in the panel uh, assess the impact that this aspect is going to have uh, in the financial sector and how might that contribute to changing the game? Okay. Let's start out with that question there on uh, shale oil and the asymmetry of um, oil production at the moment. So effectively, uh, you're asking Will you be taking out some of the small shale oil producers, BP, companies like BP? I don't think this is the appropriate forum to make uh, announcements <laughs> of that nature. But I think, generally speaking, uh, what has happened over the course of the last one year has been extraordinary. Uh, there has been a $1.6 trillion shift in the rent between producers and consumers. That is circa 2.5% of world GDP. This time last year, the price of oil, by the way, was $107 on this particular day. Uh, it is currently 53 and by pure coincidence, on this day, 10 years ago, the price of oil was $53 as well. Uh, so there's been a big, big shift. That means the industry has to recalibrate, players in the industry have to recalibrate. BP and companies like BP, Exxon and Shell and others are involved in shale in North America. Uh, I think the point that Robin was making is that the revolution, and I think this is not a bombastic word, it is the accurate description, did not get engineered by the large companies, it was by the smaller entrepreneurs. But subsequent to that initial phase, there has been some consolidation, there have been and other super majors investing, but clearly 
time. You know, you started the question of capital investments. If you look at the independent sector year to date, there has been a 40% cut in the capital. If you look at the super major, it's been around roughly, roughly 20%. So people are recalibrating. But, you know, when you look at the landscape of the day, you can be seduced into believing you have the answers. We just see this play out for a while. And there will be inevitably a recalibration that will take place. There is an argument, though, of getting more involved with shale oil production at the moment because the returns are quicker rather than plunging down into the depths of the ocean, as you said, three kilometres down, to drill down through pre-salt levels when that's very expensive at the moment. I think, again, you've got to take a long-term view. It goes back to your thesis of the future. Uh, do you see this as a secular shift or do you see this as a cyclical shift? And based on that, people will make judgments. Robin, I want to ask you also, though, to take this question about the U.S. potentially exporting its oil. This is something that I've tackled personally a number of times in forums like this with uh, the U.S. Energy Secretary, Ennis Moniz. And for the moment, no, the U.S. can't export oil. Will we see that day once? And will we see more LNG coming to Europe to try and counter Russia's dominance of the market here? A um, couple points. Um, one is that we will get to the point where we can export liquefied natural gas. It's a laborious process, but it's, it's moving that way. And uh, uh, I think that that'll cure itself. Um, oil is slightly different. There's a ban on uh, oil exports as part of the uh, uh, Export Administration Act. Um, it goes back to when the United States uh, was trying to deal with, with scarcity. Um, now that we have a surplus of crude oil, um, and of, but it's very important, it's light crude oil. And um, the fact is that right now, uh, uh, the, the globally traded price of oil is, is Brent. Um, that's sort of the international standard. Uh, WTI, West Texas Intermediate, is the U.S. standard. And there's about a $9 a barrel discount on American crude because of that ban. Um, so I think that um, uh, the industry is, is frantic to get this lifted. It's costing them $9 a barrel. Um, one may ask why uh, 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 the administration wants to help OPEC uh, uh, smother um, the American energy surge. Um, uh, but I think that there's also a fear um, of some, frankly, in the environmental community who don't want any more oil production in the United States. And there are also some people who are afraid that somehow if this change took place, that somehow the consumers would be penalized and that gasoline prices would rise. Research does not show that, but there's, a, there's an unspoken fear. Now, I know that we're just a question gets answered out of courtesy. So, uh, Commissioner Cagnetti, I'd like you to answer the gentleman's question there from the European Parliament a carbon bubble with this issue of carbon taxes, but at the same time, try to hook Europe, if you do manage to accomplish COP21 criterion that you're talking about, to keep two-thirds of the natural resources in the ground. I think that climate policies and economic growth don't, don't have any, and, 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 and are not opposed policies. In, in, the last, in the last years, in the European Union, um, we have created more than one million jobs in, in industry associated to green growth, clean energies, and renewables, energy efficiency. So there are big opportunities, there are big opportunities, big opportunities uh, when you decide to fight climate change and change your energy policy. Gas and oil will remain with us for a long time. The, the, the climate change objectives are long-term objectives. 2050, we have to reach our objectives. We will have to develop our renewables. We have to develop energy efficiency. We have to develop new techniques. We have to develop capital and storage. The European Union is going to support research and development and innovation in this area to make it a market case. Because it's the only way coal can, can, can keep on going. And that's why carbon capital and storage will be a priority of the European Union and the Horizon 2020 and the the programs and the near, near 400. We will support investigation in these areas so that we will also have these opportunities. But green growth is a possibility. And if you go to the COPs now, it's quite different than in the past. In the past, only environmental NGOs were there. Now all the industry is present there with, with, uh, with side events showing the progress that the world is doing towards clean energies and energies affordable, sustainable. Thank you very much for joining us today. Gentlemen, great to have you on the panel.